are once again promoting social causes. And when Dylan sang at this summer's Live Aid concert to benefit starving Africa, it was a dramatic performance that linked two eras. In his first network news appearance, Bob Dylan talked to Bob Brown. Dylan is now 44, he's the father of five children, and he has embraced new forms of music. Most recently, music video. By the way, the one you're going to see is in black and white. Spectators included Ringo Starr, John Lennon, and George Harrison of the Beatles. Well, the, the cliche is that he uh, speaks for his generation. He's the voice of a generation. So remember what it was Kurt like. Loder is a senior editor of Rolling Stone magazine. Popular music, popular culture seem to have no relation to anything really human. And then you have Bob Dylan come along and he's singing this strange voice and this real loud rock and roll. He's actually talking about things, about how repressed everything is and how, how stifled people are. And he said, yeah, that's exactly how I felt. You know, why couldn't I put it like that? And he, that breakthrough is something that can never be taken away from him. And it's, it's really made it a tradition of its own in pop music to communicate with people directly like that. The answer is a blowing in the wind. Even when they were new, it seemed as if some Dylan songs had been with us forever. Blowing in the wind became an anthem of the civil rights movement. Yes, and how many years can some people exist before they're allowed to be free? And like all balladeers, he wrote first-person accounts of relationships and the roads they take. Ain't it ain't no use in the turning on your light, babe. The light I never knowed. Among the generation that followed him, millions adopted the times they are a-changing as a manifesto to a system they protested. Then you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone. the times are were studied and analyzed as poetry. Now I know that England's empire has returned into sand. That is from mine. Left me blind me here to stand but still not sleeping. Fans waited for what he would say next, what he would do next. Hardcore supporters were sometimes outraged when he changed his music from folk to rock or rock to country. His rhymes, his reclusive life, his changing appearance added to the mystery. In 1979, Dylan took the most dramatic and controversial turn of his career to born-again Christianity, reflected in songs like Shot of Love and performances with an evangelical fervor. in the resurrection, he says, but he also delved intensely into his own religious heritage, Orthodox Judaism. Spiritual messages are still present in some of his music. But he has also returned to the popular mainstream to rock and roll. Said one writer, any attempt to tie him down, musically or lyrically, is bound to fail. I used to think that it's better if you just live and die and no one knows who you are. From the 
the beginning, Dylan, now 44 years old, has shied away from publicity, granting few print interviews, never agreeing to a television network news interview until now. We spoke with him on a hillside on his estate in Malibu, California, where the wind blew in from the Pacific just below his house. Because the mythology surrounding Dylan has been so embroiled in change and controversy, it was interesting to find him low-key, cordial, soft-spoken. Depending on how your music has evolved, there have been people who have actually got angry because they felt it had changed. Did that ever bother you? Well, it's always disappointing, you know, when, when people uh, decide for one reason or another they don't like your work anymore. But, uh, you know, it's just one of those things. Uh, you, you can't try to please people in that kind of way because then you're just going to be doing, uh, you'll never live it down. You know, it'll just be, uh, you know, it'll always be uh, dogging you around that uh, you might be uh, being a fake about the whole thing. So it's, a, it's sort of a no-win situation, I guess. It's not important what other people call you. If you yourself know you're a fake, that's tougher to live with. Is protest song an accurate description of, of yeah. some of the things you were doing? Um, I guess so, but the real protest songs were written really in the 30s and 40s, and which side are you on? Mining type songs, union kind of songs. Uh, that's where the protest movement developed from. There's still a strain of that type of thing in, in what I do. It's just more broad now. Do you view the lyrics that you write as poetry? I always felt the... the the need for that the type of rhyme in to say any any type of thing that you wanted to say but then again i don't know if i call myself a poet or not i would like to but i'm not i'm not um, i'm not very qualified i don't think to make that decision because i come in on such a back door that um i, I, I don't know what a, 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 you know robert frost or or uh, keats or, or T.S. Eliot would really think of my stuff. It's more of a visual type of thing for me. I could picture the, the color of the song, or the, the shape of it, or who it is that I'm trying to appeal to in this song, and, and what I'm trying to uh, almost uh, reinforce my feelings for. Uh, and, and, um, I know that sounds sort of vague and abstract, but uh, I've got a handle on it when I'm doing it. He first began to attract notice in New York's Greenwich Village in 1961, when he performed at a place called Gertie's Folk City. In those early years, he was developing a style of phrasing his lyrics that would become a Dylan trademark. Listen for the emphasis he places on the syllables in his lines. Then, for the way he strings out the sounds in a phrase, almost reciting them. Your practical dream exercise is for which you get this to be by the touch of your skin. Your magnetic movement still captures the minutes I've been. But it brings my honor to see you trying to be a part of the world that just don't exist. The phrasing that I stumbled into, some of the old folk singers used to phrase things in an interesting way. And then got my style from seeing a lot of outdoor type poets who would recite their poetry. They don't have a guitar, you recite things differently. And there used to be quite a few um, poets in the jazz clubs who uh, would recite with a different type of attitude. Among those poets, Allen Ginsberg and Lawrence Ferlinghetti, two of Dylan's friends. Listen to this recording of Ferlinghetti, and you can hear a strong resemblance to the style Dylan developed. They are the same people, only further from home, on freeways, 50 lanes wide, on a concrete continent. As the world is misty mountains, pointing out cold old six cricket alleys. In the middle of seven sad forests. In an inferno of a dozen dead oceans. We'll take thousand miles and miles of a graveyard. This vision of a 
nuclear apocalypse, a hard rain's gonna fall, began as a folk ballad Dylan wrote during the Cuban Missile Crisis. What did you see? Although Dylan has made powerful protest statements, and people have expected him to speak out for change, he has personal doubts about how politically effective those statements can be. You know, if people can change things and make a difference, uh, it seems that there are, there's a lot of false prophets around, though. And uh, that's, that's the trouble. People say they think uh, they know what's right, and, and other people can get people to follow them because they have a certain type of charisma. Uh, and uh, there's always um, people willing to take over, you know, for people, uh, people want a leader, you know, and there'll uh, be more and more of them. There have been times when uh, born again Christianity, Orthodox Judaism, both of those were important to you? Yeah. Or is it a broader thing for you? No, uh, I want to figure out what's happening, you know, and, uh, so I did look into it all. Did it make life uh, easier? Not necessarily, no. Did it make it clearer? Definitely made it clearer. This is a place you have to work certain things out. What is it you do have to work out? Well, you have to work out where your place is and who you are. Uh, but we're all spirit. That's all we have, just walking, you know, dressed up in a, in a suit of skin and um, that's we're going to leave that behind Dylan says he believes there will be a new beginning a messianic kingdom eventually in these times through his music he continues to add his voice to the causes that artists in the 80s are taking up with their songs most recently Dylan sang on an anti-apartheid record called Sun City it features a collection of artists protesting policies in South Africa, dubbed together this month in a New York recording studio. Dylan was also one of the unmistakable voices on the We Are the World recording for African Famine Relief. Producer Quincy Jones wanted a sample of Dylan's unique phrasing. And when there was some question as to exactly what Jones was after, Dylan fan Stevie Wonder sat at a piano to coach Dylan's reading. So I just basically was saying to him, hey, um, I have a lot of respect for you, and more so to just loosen the situation up, which it did, because he did an incredible job. How did you uh, raise the line for him? It's almost like kind of the minister poem. It's very unique. <laughs> Dylan supported the cause for famine relief, but not without a kind of spiritual fatalism about it. People buying the song, I mean, and the money going to uh, the starving people in Africa is, is, is a, you know, worthwhile idea, but I wasn't so convinced about the message of the song, to tell you the truth. Um, I don't think people can save themselves, you know. Save themselves? You know, you yeah, I, just don't, I don't agree with that type of thing. But there's still a sense of immediacy in Dylan's approach to problems. He provided the inspiration for this artist's benefit, Farm Aid, when he suggested at the Live Aid Famine Relief concert that some of the money raised should go to farmers. Although people still search for meanings in his songs, the message in one of his newest is simply, trust yourself. Trust yourself. as if to deflate the myths made out of him, Dylan's lyrics also read, Don't trust me to show you the truth. I like the fans, but I don't feel an obligation that I have to be an example to them, like, say, uh, maybe a baseball player would or, or uh, 
football player or maybe some other type of musicians. I don't feel I have to really set an example that somebody else has to live up to. What kind of uh, beliefs do you have in yourself to write the kinds of songs you write? Uh, not really a belief. I have very little belief in myself to do anything. Uh, I just pull it off, you know, and, and uh, it's amazing to me even that I do. At the end of the summer, before the Farm Aid concert, Dylan was on an empty motion picture sound stage for a rehearsal that at times turned into a kind of jam session with a popular rock band called Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. When the other musicians took a break, we asked Dylan if he'd do one of his older songs, whatever song he chose. He thought for a moment, and then this artist who has both angered and inspired his followers whose doubts may go hand in hand with his convictions, chose a song from 1974 that was a kind of prayer when he first recorded it. He was joined, unrehearsed, by the keyboardist and vocal group. The song is Forever Young. secluded uh, area. It's really kind of a compound on a hillside in Malibu. It's surrounded by a rather tall cyclone fence. Uh, there are guards outside the fence. Uh, we saw one of them uh, had handcuffs. And of course the reason is that there are still people who actually make a pilgrimage because they feel they have to talk to Bob Dylan or they want to know what he thinks about something. So uh, to a large extent that kind of guardedness uh, is necessary. That doesn't make him a hermit though. He's got his own circle. Well, he has a circle of friends and as far as the publicity is concerned, uh, he says he shied away from it before, but he does want to sell records. He's <laughs> 